encourage you next week to be here on time because we have something special we're going to be doing early in the service and we want you to get to benefit from that, participate. You'll hear more about that this week, but I just wanted to encourage you to please be here on time next week. It'll be a good time. It'll be fun. So today we are finishing up our sermon series called Living in His Presence. It's been a fun sermon series. Um, We've talked about the history of His presence. We've talked about His manifested presence and what happens when He is also in a state of hiddenness. He's around us all the time. And we thought we would just finish this sermon series about living in His presence with talking about very practical tools, practical spiritual disciplines that lead us to his presence. So I've got six spiritual disciplines we're going to cover today. Uh, I want to make it very practical. So if you got some paper, pen, you got some electronics, you might want to take some notes. It is more important that you hear what he says to you today than you hear what I say to you today. I'll do my best to give you something from Papa, but I want you to hear his voice today. So in this sermon series, we discovered that every creature ever created thrives in a specific environment. For birds, it's the air. For fish, it's water. But man was created to thrive in the presence of God. When you spend time in the presence of the Lord, spiritual passion, desire, dreams, faith, stuff like that comes out of our spirit. It's we're most alive when we're in his presence than anywhere else. His presence is his greatest gift to us. In his presence, you find your identity, your assignment, and your greatest fulfillment. So the sermon title is not just for the series, but this morning it's called Living in His Presence. Before I read our passage Uh, two passages I want to talk about and then cover those six spiritual disciplines. Let me lay some groundwork for just a second that's a little bit off script. Um, I was with Dr. Marks, uh, who's a family counselor at one time, and we were talking about raising kids, and he asked me, he says, how do kids spell love? And I said, L-O-V-E. T-I-M-E. That's how kids spell love, T-I-M-E. Daddy, watch me on the swing, watch me on the swing. Mama, can we go over here? Kids feel loved when we spend quality time with them. Now, parents, here's a little nuance. As children grow, it's the job of the parent to show the kid how they are uniquely different from everybody else on the planet, then celebrate that, and then spend time with them doing what they like to do in their sweet spot. That's, that's the adjustment that has to happen in parenting is we bring the kids along with us and take them to play. But once we realize that, like, they're a skateboarder, go hang out at the skate park. Don't break a hip, but don't get on the thing. I didn't say get on the thing, but I'm saying go hang out. You, you take them and you do things with them about what they like to do, and that says love for them, okay? So why are we talking about this? Because God spells love, T I M. If you want to experience the presence of the Lord, we're going to have to not be so busy, so driven, so preoccupied with everything going on in this realm and forget that there's a heavenly realm available to us if we'll take the time to spend with him. So you're like, well, Pastor Nick, it's not that I need a new tool. I just need time to use a tool. I agree with you. The number one challenge we have is taking time to be with Papa. He is languid. He likes to just hang out. He likes to take things slow. I'm always like, come on, come on, God. Give me something, God. Give me something, God. We got things to do, God. But he's like, nope, nope, nope. Just want to hang out for a little while. Let's just hang out right here. So there's a gentleman that wrote a book called The Practice of the presence of God. How many of y'all have ever read it? Practice the presence of God. Brother Lawrence, okay, this Brother Lawrence was a 17th century monk, and uh, he actually didn't write the book. He wrote letters, and he had conversations with some of the other monks there, and one of the priests there compiled these. It's a real small book. It's called The Practice of the Presence of God, and there were two key things, two key lessons I learned out of that book I want to share with you today. That once I read them, once I saw them, never lost them. And I want to give them to you before I read our passage to sort of set the stage. The first thing that Brother Lawrence said was, he said, the easiest way to get into the presence of God is to never leave it to start with. Yeah, brilliant. That's just brilliant. I mean, that's so simple that it's brilliant. 
And he said, and this is what he would do. He's a monk, and he would, he would get up in the morning, and he would go get his Bible, and he would do daily devotions, and he'd spend time in prayer until he felt the presence. Now, let me just say this. We already know this. God is present everywhere. Okay? So it's not like he wasn't here and then he showed up. No. We just became aware that he's in the room. He's with us all the time. He's omnipresent. But so what Brother Lawrence would do is he'd get up in the morning, read his Bible, do some prayer time, until he knew that the presence of God was right here with him. And then it'd be time for chow, be time for breakfast. So he would go out and he would serve breakfast to people, but he never left the presence. God was right here and he was constantly in communion with him. And as he served that food, he would love them as father would love them. He stayed in that place and after they were all fed, he'd get the dishes and he'd go worship God. As he did the dishes, he kept God's presence in the forefront with every activity he did. Now, you would say, hey, Nick, that's easier being a 17th century monk than going to Walmart. You know, a little hard to carry, you know, hard to keep it there, right, in Walmart. But, but, but it's a little bit different, but I believe that it's the same principle, and I believe we can do it. I believe we can. So, for, and so the easiest way to get in the presence of God is to never leave it to start with. The second thing Brother Lawrence said was this. He says, when man sins, there is this natural proclivity to get upset with ourselves, feel ashamed, and pull away from God for a season of punishment. And he says, I refuse to do that. When I, rep- when I sin, I quickly repent and I stay in his presence. Because here's, and here's what I'll, I'll share this with you. When, whenever we sin, we cannot be separated from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. He has sealed us. He has set his love on us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So when we sin, two things happen. First of all, Papa convicts us of the sin. He convicts us of the sin. And the devil tries to sneak in condemnation at the same time. Papa convicts us of the sin because he doesn't want us through shame or guilt, to remove ourselves from relationship with him or his presence. The devil sneaks in condemnation, shame, guilt, because he wants to drive a wedge between your relationship with God. I I promise you when I say this, a bunch of us in the room is going to say, yep, I've done that. Have you ever sinned, been disgusted with yourself, can't believe you did that, and voluntarily pulled away from the Lord for several days or several weeks because you just didn't feel like you deserved his grace? That's the devil. It's the devil. By the way, if you get thoroughly disgusted with yourself because you do sin, you're putting too much pride in your flesh. There ain't nothing good in your flesh. Except for the goodness of God, we all could sin in every sin there can be. Right? And if you get mad at yourself, you put too much confidence in your flesh because your flesh is drawn to earthly desires. So what we should do is keep his presence with us all times. If we do sin, say, uh uh-uh, devil, you're not going to, in Jesus' name, I repent of that sin, and I, God, I ask your forgiveness. Now I jump right back in your presence, and I'm going to stay with you, and we're going to keep walking. That'll keep you from sin, but also it'll keep you in his presence. Is that, is that good, Brother Lawrence? Does that set the stage for us? Okay. I'm going to read two passages to you, one out of Isaiah and one out of Psalms, Isaiah 64, 1 through 4. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. I just, I love Isaiah. I just love what, the way he sees this. You know, it's like this, there's a thin veil between heaven and earth. And, and you just want to pierce it just to step through that veil of the eternal of God and the realm of heaven and the realm of the temporal and the realm of earth. And, and, and he, he sees it as, God, would you just rend the heavens? Would you just tear back the heavens and come down and see us? We want to see you. I just love that language. That you would come down, now watch the cause and effect here, that the mountains might shake at your presence. If God's in Western North Carolina, the mountains should be smoking, they should be shaking. Good stuff. As fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down. The mountains shook at your presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. Now, we're going to talk about corporate worship here in a second. Pastor Blake was all over my sermon. But 
But this verse says, who acts for the one who waits for him. That word wait is to tarry, to, just, to take your time, not be in a hurry. If you'll spend some time with him, if you'll wait on him, if you'll, if you'll tarry, he moves for one. You don't have to get a quorum. You don't have to get a petition signed. You don't have to get everybody in unity. All you have to do is wait before him, and he's willing to move for one person. All right, now in the second passage of Psalms, 16, 5 through 11, and it says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. I love that. I'm going to sing a song about that in a minute. You are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. I love how happy this psalm is. If you're in a bad mood, go home and read Psalm 16. It's a happy psalm. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. My glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. That's a lot of good stuff. Glad, rejoicing, hope. For you will not leave my soul and shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. He, he says, if I get in your presence, there's a fullness of joy and there's hope and there's rejoicing and glory. And then there's pleasures evermore. What's that going to be like? I don't even know. He just starts saying, you know, it's good now. I mean, my, my, my lot has fallen in good place. My inheritance is good, but I'm going to enjoy pleasures forevermore. I should just be happy. I think the church needs to like read that psalm over and over and over again until we get down in our spirit. We start driving different. Come on. Okay. We, we start acting different at food line. You know what I'm saying? We need to get that happy pill for that comes from being in the presence of the Lord where we got the joy of God all over us, right? All right. So there are six spiritual disciplines that I'm aware of that I've practiced that I want to walk you through some things that, one, I'm hoping that, uh, that if you find one that really works for you, feel free to enjoy it as long as you want. But I'm hoping that you'll at least try a new one in the next week or two. That you'd be willing to say, I call God Papa, that you'd be willing to say, Papa, I want to try that. Would you meet me in that place? Because I guarantee you he wants to meet us in that place. The first one's worship. Now, I picked worship, and I, we're defining worship this morning as corporate praise and worship, not a daily lifestyle of worship. And, and we talk about where the, the, one of the easiest places to experience the presence of God is in corporate worship. He says, where two or more gather together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So, so when, when we gather together in his name, we already know his presence is here. Now, all we're trying to do is become aware of that. Remember, Pastor Brian, I quoted you last week that, that he taught me the best definition of worship I've ever heard. Worship is simply when we become aware that his presence in the, is in the room and relevant to every circumstance in our life. That, that's, that truly is worship. It, it's the moment we're singing a song. And suddenly he's talking to me, and I see him on his throne, and my problem's this big. In that moment, I can praise and worship him because he has me in the palm of his hand. That's that worship is a response to a view of God that is bigger than you, but applies to your lifestyle. And so one of the things like we get together, two or more gathered in his name, we know his presence here. Uh, it, singing songs is something we can do together. Did you enjoy singing together today? Did you, did you hear how loud everybody was? How bought in they were? Everybody singing together. I, I just, even the O's. Oh, 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 oh. And, and I can't do the O's, right? But, but, but we're all singing, oh, whoever dreamed we would get together on Sunday morning and sing the O's. How come it's not the E's? I've always wondered why O gets all the attention. Ooh, huh? Oh, Oz, Oz, yeah, Oz. That's not a vowel, though. So, um, so, oh, so we got the O's, and you no, know, but we're, but but it's something we can do. Like in a, in a lot of de denominations, they have liturgy where they read scriptures together, they pray prayers together, and I think that's really cool. We don't do that, but I think it's really cool. But one thing we do do together is we sing songs together. It brings us. There's something special when you're full of faith and you're singing, 
and somebody next to you is really struggling, but they lean into your faith. They lean into your joy. They lean into the hope you're expressing. They, 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 just, they can borrow a little bit of your hope because you're declaring his glory and his goodness. Um, so when we sing together, that's what happens. We, we pull up the whole body of Christ together for that experience. We, we usually will sing somebody else's song, somebody who lives far away, who had a personal experience with God, and in that personal experience, they pinned a song to him that somehow named, identified, captured a thought, and then they start singing, writing the song, and we start listening to it, and we're like, yeah, man, I wish, I've, I've, yeah, that's exactly what I thought. I wish I could have named it. I wish I could have said it. Like That's exactly how I feel. And, 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 and then we borrow that song and we all use that personal song and we begin to worship God together and we experience that, that corporate thing when, when you know what I know. You've experienced what I've experienced. It's like when I talk to people who pray a lot and I pray a lot and we talk together, we just have a language. and we see, There's just this intimacy of knowing each other in the spirit realm. And so when we sing together and we sing that song, you have no rival. I can't do it without pointing. You, you have no rival. That's, that's the only song I worship like this. But I do because it's so... It's just, it's just he, they named it, and we were all like, yeah, that's exactly right. So you didn't know that this could be worship. Yeah. It is. And, um, but, but, but then the goal, the goal then is to create space, and we did that this morning in the third song, is create space for you to sing your song. Because that corporate is like a runway. It moves us down the runway, and it throws us to the sky. Now it's time to fly. And in that moment, I find my own song. Now, Papa loves for me to sing in front of you because he knows I can't sing. I don't care. I grew up in poverty, so I grew up knowing hunger, knowing lack, knowing rationing. Uh, I was on free lunches in middle school and high school, and I thanked God for that, except when the cool kids were around and I didn't want to use my card. I'd rather be hungry and sit there than be uncool and there's people in the room that know what I'm saying. You understand that? So when I'm in worship and we sing the song, you are my portion, <laughs> I start singing, you are my meat and vegetables. You are my dessert and my drink. My plate is buffet style big. My goblet is overflowing with your goodness. I'm going to get me some marriage supper of the lamb one day. Ooh, lamb sounds good right about now. <laughs> but I'll, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> we just wrote a song. Um, that, 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 um, but, but I begin to sing my song to him and say, you have filled me up. I do not lack. I have enough left over. Thank you for your grace. You've been good to me. You've sustained me a long time. In fact, your meat is better for me than even natural meat. I, I sustain myself off of you and off of your presence. Worship is to take us to a place corporately and then individually where we adore him. And what happens is, is, that, is that he woos us here. We sing a generic song. We, we get a vision that he's in the room. We then begin to sing and give to him our worship because when you see him, you have to give him your worship. Once we give him our worship, Papa says, oh, you want to do some of that? And he steps over that back to us and says, look at this. And you're like, whoa, holy, holy, holy. And then we give him our praise. And then he steps over that and says, you want more? And that's how, that's how that goes. It, he initiates, we respond, worship is a response. Then he over-responds to our response. And we try to find something new because you can't give him what you gave him yesterday. You try to find some new thing to throw out there. And then he goes over top of that. That's worship. And you can do that in your car. You can do that at home. Walk around singing, changing the atmosphere of your home. It's beautiful stuff. Worship is a good way to know his presence. Two is prayer. You all know my journey with prayer, that I was a pastor that did not pray until a couple years ago. I prayed. I mean, I showed up and prayed cardboard prayers for like 15, 30 minutes because I, I was supposed to. By the way, I hate religious rituals. I hate them. 
There's nothing wrong with a reading plan to read through the Bible for a year. There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't like reading a passage so that I can check it off my box that I read the Bible today. I don't like going into prayer because I'm supposed to pray or I'm a bad person. I hate it. I would rather not do, I don't want you to do anything that's religious ritual, that's dry cardboard, because he deserves so much better than that. And you need relationship with him. And if you just sit and think about him for a while instead of reading the Bible or praying or journaling or anything else, he's okay with that. You've got to find what works for you to be able to know his presence. And he cares way more about being with you than you checking something off the box. I can't even imagine the God who is love writing a love letter and me reading it as fast as I can so I can cross it off my list for the day. Wow. What's that? So anyway, prayer. So in prayer, now, so I started praying a couple years ago and um, learned a couple things about prayer. So I'm going I'm to share you a contrast of two different styles of prayer. For me, when I start, when I'm alone with the Lord and I start to pray, um, by the way, I'm an extrovert. So I like to talk. So when I go sit down with Papa, guess what I do? Jabber, 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 jabber. That's what I do, right? I'm a talker. So it's fine. Hey, Papa, how you doing today? You everything good with you? I got something I got to talk to you about. Got some things going on in my world. You know, you, you, I don't know if you know where, you know, what's going on over here, what's going on over there. We need to pray about this. By the way, I was thinking about that the other day. And I just talk about 15, 20 minutes. I just talk, 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 talk. And I get it all out. And when I do, I catch my breath and pause for a minute, and then he steps in. I just create space. I just download. I just create some space. And when I create space, he just, he just, he's like, okay, I'll fill some of that spot. And then he starts talking to me. And then we start to do the dance back and forth, a conversation back and forth together. That works for me. It just does. Now, Dr. Jim Marks, one of my best buddies, one of our elders, he does the exact opposite. He says to me, Nick, why would you tell the God that knows everything all the stuff that you think he doesn't know. You are wasting 15 to 20 minutes of good prayer time because you're informing the God of the universe what he already knows. So when Jim goes into prayer, he goes and sits down, zip, not one word. And I said, well, how's that work for you? And he said, well, I just sit there. And he says, then these thoughts start going through my mind. Some of them are godly thoughts. Some of them are ungodly thoughts. And he says, I, I let the ungodly thoughts stay there because I'm in the presence of God. And maybe there's something that ungodly thought, godly thought I need to repent of. Or there's an ungodly, a, 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 soulish, uh, a soul tie. Maybe there's an ungodly belief there. And he says, I just sit with Papa and say, what do you want to talk about? And he says, Nick, do you know what happens when I sit there and don't say one word to God? I said, what? He goes, he jabber, jabber, jabbers. Jabber, 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 jabber. And he says, here's the thing, Nick. Every word you're talking is a moment you're not listening. And he says, I already know what I know. I just don't know what I don't know. And how am I going to know what I don't know if I don't just be quiet? Now, I'm, I, listen, I love him. I still like my way. I just need, I need to be heard. <laughs> in case it's not in the record of heaven, we need some help down here. You know, <laughs> I, it, I just got to introduce it into the court. It's got to, it's got to be documented, right? Jim, on the other hand, is like, dog, I'm gonna be okay. So I said, well, Jim, I said, what happens? Like, if you take an hour for prayer, what happens? He said, Papa will just jabber, 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 and he usually will not talk to me about the thing I want to talk about. I mean, I need an answer. I need, I need direction about something. And so I'll just say, talk about whatever you want to. And he usually will not. And at the very end, I'll say, when are we going to get to this problem I have and what we're going to do? And he says, 50% of the time he'll answer me and 50% he doesn't. Half the time he answers me and says, here's the answer I wanted to give you. He said, but if I don't have an assignment or a role in the situation, he won't give me an answer. And that's my way of knowing stay out of it, not for you. He says, sometimes he won't speak to me in that one hour about what I want to talk about because he just wants to know, do I want to be with him? Or is he a genie in a bottle? I'm just trying to get something from him. He says, what I'll do is he'll, we'll stay there for an hour. And I'm like, come on, Pop, I need an answer. He won't give it to me, but we'll spin together for an hour. And then 20 minutes later, I'm driving down the road, and a circumstance will happen, and I will see him clearly, and I'll have my answer. 
Hang in there. Give Papa the Spirit. So there's three levels of prayer, three things I've had. The first is purposeful prayer, like you have a prayer list. There's some people you've committed to pray for. You know, I'll do that in the first 20 minutes. I just pray, you know, God, I'll intercede for our nation. I'll, you know, there's things we need to pray for. We have an agenda. We're thing, be it purposeful. We got to move from the purposeful into his presence, where we just need to be with him. We need to know this is the general stuff. This is specific stuff. We just want to be in his presence. We want to know, God, I can hang in there if I know you're in the situation. As long as I know your hands on it, I'll leave it alone. But I just, I got to know you're here. I got to know you're, you're, you're available for me. And then, where I, after spending enough time in prayer, I move from the presence place to the pleasure place, where you're just. You don't even care if you get your to-do list done. You don't even want to go back to work. And I'm a pastor. So you, you just want to be with him. You, you feel his joy for you. You realize, have, have you ever done this? Have you ever been in prayer and you're having an intimate moment and suddenly he pulls one circumstance from your past up and shows it to you in a new light? You said, oh my gosh, he was there all along. Oh, are you kidding me? Oh my gosh, you were there all along. You had this in your hand the whole time. I didn't know. And, and he, you can see how meticulously he's watched over you all these years. How his heart delights in being with you. I love prayer because I've spent enough time to get to the pleasure place where I enjoy his presence. And I love watching him love me. I love it. It's, it's, a, it's addictive. It's addictive to be in his presence and feel his pleasure through prayer. All right, number three, fasting. Woohoo! <laughs> Who likes to fast? <laughs> Fasting is when you um, do without food for a period of time, and it's really for two purposes. The first is, is to tell our body that it doesn't run our life and make room for our spirit to step forward. So, so two things for, for fasting. It, it, it is for a spiritual awakening and awareness and also to function in more power. When Jesus was tempted for 40 days in prayer, he, w- he went to prayer and fast, and he came out in power. So the first thing is, is that we set aside a time to fast from food to be able to say to our body, you don't rule my life. My spirit man is what guides my life. You follow the spirit man. And we say, Papa, I'm, I'm setting aside my fleshly food because I want spiritual. Remember when Jesus, remember when the, he was at the well, he sent the guys to go get food. He met the woman at the well. They came back, gave him the food, and he says, don't need it. I have food, I have meat to eat that you know not of. There's spiritual food you can have if you will not satiate that hunger in physical food. Okay? So we just, and, and listen, if you don't think that you're not addicted to food, try going out without it for one day. And King Belly will rebel. He'll start talking to you. Rumble, 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 rumble. Feed me. Oh, by the way, here's the thing about fasting. If you choose to fast from food for a day, TV commercials will triple the amount of food advertisements (laughs) suddenly on that one day that you're trying to fast. They come out with a new triple stuffed crust pizza. For a limited time, only one day. I mean, yeah, it's a crazy. You, I was like, really? Today I had to fast? So one, it is, one is to say, Father, I want my spirit man in tune with you in a new way. By the way, Isaiah 58, you can write that down. Isaiah chapter 58 is the landmark chapter on fasting in the Bible. And, um, and in that, the people were saying, hey, why aren't you doing what we want you to do, God? We're fasting. And he's like, because... The way you're fasting is just to manipulate me to do something. I want to fast that causes injustice to be dealt with. I want to fast where the poor are taken care of, the widow are taken I want. I want to change your heart. You're, trying, you're, you're using a fast to get something for you. I want you to use a fast to be able to serve other people better. So we fast to turn down our flesh, turn up our spirit. Maybe we use the meal time that we would have been eating as devotion time to be able to find his presence. The other is that we walk in more power. Now, I said, um, you know, time's important to God. Let me show you something I learned through my journey with prayer. I've shared this with you once before, so you probably remember. But um, the Lord, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I got a lot of people praying for me. I mean, a lot of people pray for me. But I don't think my life's as powerful as it should be. I mean, we're, we should be farther along. We, we, we should, don't you say amen. We, we should be, this is me and God talking. This is not your conversation. 
But me and God, I was like, God, we should be farther along than we are. I mean, my prayers should be more powerful. And, and I said, I don't understand. He says, yeah. He says, other people praying for you has an exponential factor to it. Because God loves to watch his kids pray for other people's needs, not their own needs. There's something powerful. That's why I pray over these Connect cards every week. Because I want to release the, 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 the authority that God has given me. I want to release that upon your life. I want to get behind you. And, and so he says other people's prayers for you are, have an exponential power. I said, then why aren't we seeing more fruit in my life? And he says, because 100 times zero is still zero. You don't pray. <laughs> you start praying and that hundred times will go crazy in your life, right? It works with fasting. Right now, presently, on Mondays, I fast as part of a team of people that are fasting for a specific assignment. A specific person is leading this assignment, and we have covenant with them to get behind them and fast with them to push them deep into their assignment and to pop through the enemy line and bring breakthrough. And so we fast together because God loves that corporate unity. When we There's power, way more power. The, the, the sum is more than the parts. If you have 10 people fasting, it's really 100 or 1,000. It's not 10 because they're doing it together in unity. Does that make sense? You might want to try fasting. I think it might help you. Number four, Bible study. Studying the Word of God. Now, here's where I get in a little bit of trouble from time to time. So help me, Lord. We're on camera. Um, this is the Bible. I love the Bible. In air, infallible, perfect Word of God. The rule by which we judge everything is right here. This is, a, the, this is the word of God, but this is not the totality of the word of God. We sang the song this morning, you were there in the beginning. The word was there in the beginning. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was, is God. And by him all things are created. Sometimes when we talk about the Bible, we talk about it as if it is Jesus. It's not Jesus. Jesus is a person we have a relationship with, and this word is part of the word of God. Does that make sense? And I say that only to say, not to take anything away from the word at all. I love the word as much as anybody does, and I believe it is the perfect word of God. But you could be a master on the book and never know the person of Jesus. And, and the goal of the book is not to be educated. It is to be intimate with the creator of the book. And so when we read the word, it's important that we first say, Jesus, you are the word, and I want to know more about you and the Father, myself, my assignment. So as I read this word, I'm not reading for education. I'm reading for relationship with you. Show it to me. Open my eyes. So I think reading the Bible regularly is important. Uh, I, I like to read it on a macro level, and I like to read it on a micro level. So what's a macro level look like? Like one day I'll say I'm going to read 10 chapters today. I want to read 10 chapters. And there's a lot of benefits. If you're driving down the highway at 80 miles an hour, if you're driving down the highway at the speed limit, in the right lane except when you're passing. Okay, so funny. Th so, so this week, okay, confession time. This week, me and Pastor Chip and Sheila had to go to Asheville for something. And when we got out of our last meeting, we jumped in the car, and they said, you want me to drive? I said, no, I'm driving. I'm driving. Get in my car. Get in my car. I am driving. Get, get in my car. I'm driving. Which I usually don't care, but we're in a hurry. So, so I get on the highway. I'm getting it. I'm talking. Sheila's talking. I'm talking. Sheila's talking. I'm talking. Sheila's talking. Chip ain't talking. I look. Uh, that's exactly I, Something's wrong. <laughs> so I look over at Chip and I say, you okay? He says, yeah, I'm just repenting for you right now. <laughs> Didn't you do it? <laughs> I'm repenting for you right now because you're breaking all the laws of the land. All the laws. Uh, so if you're driving down the highway and you look over at telephone poles, if you're driving 100 miles an hour, they look different than if you're driving 10 miles an hour. Okay. So when you look at the Word of God, if you read big chunks of passage, it looks different than if you read small chunks of passage. And both are important, okay? So, by the way, make me pray for you for divine curiosity here in the next few minutes if I forget, okay? So what happens is, one day, I'm, I'm going to do macro, 
and I read 10 chapters, the last 10 chapters of Genesis. And as I'm reading the last 10 chapters of Genesis, it says, and Joseph wept. And I said, interesting. Next page, and Joseph cried. Next page, and Joseph wept bitterly. Next page. In the last 10 chapters of Genesis, Joseph cries like eight times. <laughs> eight times. And I'm like, Joseph, man, what's up with you, dude? I mean, you're like crying everywhere. You're a crybaby. You're everywhere crying. What is, no, no, if I only read one chapter a day, I might miss that. But because I read all 10 chapters at one time, I am just, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm curious. I'm, I'm, and that's one of the things I, I have with the word particularly is divine curiosity. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray that over you in just a second. So I, I'm like, man, you're crying all the time. And the Lord just speaks to me. He said, why wouldn't he? And Ma, his mother died when he was a baby. His brother sold him into slavery. He ended up in jail against his own will with no friends, no family. He was even betrayed by the guys in the jail he even helped. This guy is a second in command of the largest, most powerful country on the earth at the time. And he's still a broken little boy. And his brothers come in and he plays games with them. Because you can be 50 years old and still be an 8-year-old emotionally because you never got transforming you or ultimate journey. You never got healing. So now you got the second most powerful guy in the world playing games with his brothers like a little petty teenager because he's never gotten healed. And I see it, and my heart breaks for Joseph, but I only saw it because I I read in in a big chunk. I read enough to be able to see what was in that story. So it's, it's helpful. I see more trends when I read big. If I read like the book of Genesis in five days, You'll see trends that you didn't see there before, and you're like, wow, that, that, that goes there and that goes there. That makes sense. It's also important to read micro, and this is what I call nuggets. Um, I was trained in preaching to start reading a book in the Bible, just start with the first chapter, first verse, and just read until you find something that you stumble over. It's something that makes you curious. It's something you don't agree with. It's something that doesn't make sense. It's something that's out of place. And then you stop and dig as deep as you can go. It's not about how much ground you can cover. It's about how fertile the ground is that you land on. So, for instance, I'll just give you two. Um, The Bible talks about, I was just talking to Debbie about it recently. The Bible talks about when Jesus was going to Jerusalem to die for our sins. Important moment for all mankind. And it says Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to die. And it says, and as he's passing through, and I think it's Bethany, as he's passing through Bethany, on his way to Jerusalem. So the Bible clearly says that Jesus' end goal is Jerusalem, and his goal is to pass through this town to get to Jerusalem so he can die for the sins of the world. Most important thing that's ever happened in human history. And it says, and then he reached the spot where Zacchaeus had climbed up in a tree. And says, Zacchaeus, come down, for today I must come to your house. The Bible clearly says that Jesus is on a mission and he's just passing through the city. He's just passing through. But when he reaches the spot that Zacchaeus created by faith, he can't walk past it. He says, come down, I must. You've done something that makes me have to come to your house today. It's like this morning in heaven, we had this all planned out, but now we have a divine interruption because Zacchaeus climbed up in a tree. And when I see that, I'm like, I want to know how to do that. I want to know how to mark. Remember that uh, not too long ago, I was talking about the passage, and it says that the boys, the the disciples were out in the lake and and out in the sea, and and, and there was a storm, and, and Jesus was over on the land. And so it says Jesus walked across the water, walked by the boat, and it says, and he would have passed them by. What? Where is he going? Why is he on the, why is he on the sea if he ain't going to stop? What? I, that, and that's what happens to me. I just stop. I, this makes no sense at all. The boys are in trouble. He saw they were in trouble while he was on the land. That's the reason he even came in the sea. He got off of the land, walked on the sea because he saw they were in trouble. But it says he would have passed them by. And I said, Papa, you're going to have to have show me this. I don't even understand. You came near them, but you didn't come to them. And Papa says, not everybody in a storm wants me in their boat. I'm around all the time. But I'm not always in your boat because you don't always want me in your boat. I'm like, help me, Jesus. How many times have you passed me by? And I sat there struggling to survive in the boat in the storm 
Oh, help me, Jesus. So what happens is, you know, like, like Job. I'm sitting there going, hey, have you seen my servant Job? No, 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 don't bring my name up. I don't, why, why'd you bring his name up? Well, you know, there are things in the scripture that you, so divine curiosity is when you read something and it doesn't make sense. You read something and it's out of place. You read something and you've seen it somewhere else before, but you don't know where. You see something and you're just like, God, what is there? something there. Jensen Franklin um, is one of the great preachers in America, in my opinion. But Jensen Franklin, he said this one time. He says, more pastors would be famous if they, if they didn't preach a little bit on every subject, but they preached really deep on a couple subjects. And so Jensen's, Jensen is known. What is Jensen known for in his writing? Fasting. He's, he is the guru, the guy on fasting. He's the guy who studied fasting. He's the guy that does fasting. He leads his church in fasting. And, and, I, and I know that we have to preach the whole counsel of God. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is we, we usually get content knowing a little bit about everything. Rather than letting God give us one or two assignments and go as deep as we can go, deeper than the world has ever seen before. Micro helps us get there. Okay, So I have this divine curiosity. I, I read something and go, hmm, that's different. And I just see from a different perspective. I'm very curious. I don't even care to finish the page, finish the chapter. I want to know what's hidden underneath that rock, right? So can I pray over you for divine curiosity? Father, right now, I just release your divine curiosity over this congregation that we'll be intrigued with the word of God. We will pay attention to circumstances in our lives. We will see you more clearly than we ever have. And when we see there's a sign that you're there, we'll slow down and we'll dig and we'll give you a chance to make us aware of what we don't see. But I pray for divine curiosity all over this room that we would want to see you, want to know what you're saying and doing, and that we would take that very seriously. And I ask that this week would be a week of finding lots of treasure Because you want to speak to us about yourself, about ourselves, and about our assignments. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, By the way, remember when we talked about, uh, and and we're almost done, we talked about manifestation of God's presence and what he does when he's in in the hidden place. So after I get done preaching, I love that our house is full of preachers in here. we got plenty of preachers. And um, Pastor Jim Brackett was in first service, and he comes up to me afterwards and says, Hey, i got a new one from R.T. Kendall. That has to do with what you're preaching. He says, every man is in pursuit of the presence of God. He said, when you see God, when, you, when he makes himself aware, it is because he wants to please you. That's why he makes himself aware. He wants to please you. And when he stays hidden, he wants to see, do you want to please him? I like that. I just want to know, do you want me? Do you want to be with me? Do you want to come? Come get me. Isn't that good? All right. Number five is journaling. Um, my wife and I, uh, at the beginning of this year, I, I've never been a journaler. Um, and so back in January, Tina and I started a journey together, uh, a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. And The Artist's Way is a classic written about 30 years ago. Um, sh- she is spiritual, seems Christian, but I don't know. So I can, I'm a mature Christian. I can spit out the bones. Okay, so one, she, she, she has a 12-week study with, with activities and stuff like that to develop your inner artist. She believes everybody's an artist somewhere, so develop your creativity and your art. Tina's a painter. I'm a writer. So we decided to do it together, do the homework, do the devotions, read the stuff together. And one of the things that she encourages is, as, as any kind of creative people, is start the morning with about 20 minutes. It takes, she wants you to write three morning pages. She calls them morning pages. About the size of my notebook, I just, I just, I just write. It takes me about 20 minutes to write three pages. And she says, there's really no purpose. You're just getting up in the morning. you got things in your head. Just download. Just, just get it out. If you can just get that out, it clears the pipe work for new creative thoughts to come out. It's, it's just a de-interizing, decluttering kind of activity, okay? And so I said, well, I'll try it, I'll try it. So I just start writing, you know, hey, I got to get broccoli today. Not looking forward to staff meeting. Um, that was a joke. It was a joke. It was a joke. The congregation loved it. Um, the, um, we, uh, you, you know, you, you got to get the mail and, you know, all that kind of stuff and, and, and what happens for me is about five minutes in, 
I go from mundane stuff, suddenly I'm talking to him, and I'm saying, you know, God, the other day when this happened, I was a little frustrated about that, but I really believe your hand was in that. And I'm, next thing, I am praying through my journaling to him. Now, I don't know if unsaved people do that, but I know I do that. And some of my best ideas and thoughts come through that. One time, a couple weeks ago, I wrote a, book, I wrote a blog on um, the smudge of shame. Where that came from, I'm writing my morning pages, and I made a mistake, and I went back to fix it in my writing. I misspelled something, and my pen had a little blob of ink, and I went back to fix it. And when I did, the blob was there. So I tried to fix the blob, and I smudged it. And the Lord says, that's what you do regularly. I said, what? He says, the mistake is made. But instead of giving it to me, you try to fix it and you smudge it with shame. And now you're wearing around a spot on you of where you tried to fix it instead of giving it to me. I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> 6, 12 in the morning. Right in the morning. I mean, that's, that's how easy he speaks. If you want him to speak to you, he'll speak to you. And, and, and so more, journaling is a way to just, to just sit with Papa, capture some thoughts, You'll start praying, you'll start speaking to him, he'll start speaking to you. But I, it's, it really is, works for me. And I'm going to encourage you that if, if you've never tried journaling, this week, take seven days, journal for 15, 20 minutes, and just, I dare you, I double dog dare you, because I dare you to come in here next Sunday and say, it doesn't work. I dare you, because it will work. If you sit with him and you start writing, it just all takes time. But if you'll do it, It'll work. Point number six, worship team's moving. <laughs> meditation. Now, meditation gets a bad rap because of, you know, people who don't know God. This is their attempt to find God. But um, God told uh, Joshua to meditate day and night on the book of the law. Uh, Psalm 119, 97 through 99 says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I believe personally, of the six, meditation is the key spiritual discipline to keep us in the presence of God. We come into worship this morning, and we're aware of his presence. Hopefully something in what I've said this morning has as Papa has spoken to you about something. When you leave and you go to the restaurant after church, you talk to each other about what God spoke to you this morning, what, what you heard him say, and you meditate on it. You drive down the road and you think about how it felt to be in worship this morning and what Papa said to you and what that could mean. And Meditation, um, Dr. Harvey, I heard him preach this one time, and he was an old, he's an old farmer, and I'm not, so I'll do my best. But he said, you know, when a cow eats the cud, it swallows after he chews it up, swallows it, then he regurgitates it again and chews it again. And then swallows it again. Now, I know that sounds yucky, but stay with me. I believe the value of the word God speaks to you is on how many times you regurgitate it and swallow it again. I've been in places where I've heard the word of God and I put it in my pocket but never made it in my mouth. There's other words he put in my mouth that I have chewed on and assimilated and chewed on and assimilated and chewed on and now they're part of the fabric of my life. If we honor his word, he'll give us some new word, okay? By the way, one last story. When you read the word... When I was 11, my father taught me how to hear the voice of God. And the way he did this, when I came home from school, he'd take, go in your room and read a chapter in the Bible and then come out and tell me what God says. I'd go, I hated doing it. I didn't want to do it at 11 years old. I wanted to go play ball or something. I'd go to my room, I'd read the chapter, come back, and I'd tell him what the chapter said. He said, I didn't ask you to tell me what the chapter said. Tell me what God said. And I'd go back again, and I'd read the chapter, come back and pick something else. He said, I didn't ask you to tell me what the chapter said. What did God say? And over time, as a young boy, the Lord began to disciple me and teach me how to read his word until it started reading me. And that's the goal of reading the Bible. You read it till it reads you. But I believe that God wants a deeper relationship with us. It's available to us. 
And I hope that one of those six things, God sparked an inspiration in you. And this week, we can all lean in a little bit to see if we can discover his presence. Is that good? Okay. Lord, we honor you for your presence in this place today. We honor you for your word. We honor you for the time we had in worship today. And Papa, right now, I'm just asking that this week you would woo us into deeper conversations with you. You'd help us each to just pick one and set aside some time to spend time with you. Your word is life to us. Your word is life to us. We need it, God. Oh, man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So I pray this week our ears would be full of your voice. And we would hear you and know who you are. We'd learn some things about ourselves, but also, God, that we'd know our assignment. So we just submit ourselves to you and ask that you would woo us into a deeper awareness of your presence this week. Lord, if there's anybody here today who has never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm asking that today that love will compel them to cross over that threshold and give themselves to you. I'm asking that you would give them the strength to come down front and let some folks pray with them. We all know that who've experienced it, it's the greatest thing you can ever experience. And we ask if there's anybody that doesn't know you, that today they would be compelled to relationship with you. In Jesus' name.